J. Michael Straczynski, uh, you created Sense8 on Netflix, uh, along with the Wachowskis, uh, and, it, and it's such an unusual, ambitious concept for a show uh, with characters from around the world connected psychically. Uh, what was the genesis of this idea? Uh, well, I've known uh, Lana and Lily for many, many years, and we share certain commonalities. We tend to both think that uh, as a species, we are better together than we are apart, that at a time when um, politics and culture seems to be dividing us, uh, right now we are more tribalized and marginalized and factionalized than ever, that a show talking about the fact that we are better together than we are apart that we are strengthened, not diminished by a multitude of voices, might be a good message to pass along. And we met up in San Francisco, Alana and I, to sort of figure out what we wanted to do. And what we both came to was a notion that we have this sense that our cultural differences are so broad and so wide. And what if there was someone who was, you know, from the Indian culture or from American culture or German culture or Korean culture living inside your head suddenly? How would you react to them culturally? What if that person had access to your secrets, to your background, to your skills? Um, would you be terrified? How would you react to that? And what ultimately it came down to, um, I have friends, three dubious words to begin with, but I have friends, uh, who, who will often be in different parts of the world at the same time. And to share an experience, they will you know, queue up a movie in Iceland or Germany or US or elsewhere hit play at the same time, then text about it or talk about it in the, in the corner of the Skype to share that experience. There's something about the human psyche that needs connection, that needs family, that needs to reach out and form communities. And let's take that notion of a shared experience and broaden it out to these characters who are, you can see them as if they're in the same room with you. They share your experiences and you learn from each other and you get to overcome any cultural biases you may have along the way. And that's uh, one thing that uh, really struck me about this show in particular is, uh, uh, you know, I, the, the one word that stuck with me throughout the season that I had in my head was just empathy. Uh, and it seems to be, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the tribalism that we have is, is mostly a result of us not really knowing the people who, you know, who are in the other tribes. And, and this seems to uh, sort of really just collapse that gap completely. Yeah, if you look at the history of civilization, nice broad topic to begin with, um, empathy is the core glue needed for civilization. You first have empathy with your, your family, then that broadens out to your tribe, and the tribe across the way are the bad guys. Then you meet them, get to know them, you, have, you develop empathy. Now there's there several tribes who are, you have empathy for, and now you have a small group. Then the broader out empathy goes, more civilization tends to go with it. And now it's this nation against that nation. And hopefully with time, uh, as we become more and more one world, that the empathy will extend beyond the, the national borders. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, these days, uh, diversity uh, is, is such a, an important topic when it comes to entertainment these days. But but in addition to, to the idea of, of getting to know uh, people from around the world and other people's experiences and experiencing that empathy. It's also just really good for for compelling drama to have so many different perspectives and conflicting uh, 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 characters and, and and ideas and cultures. Uh, you know, how did you decide uh, sort of which sort of cultures to draw from when, when building the show? A lot of it was driven by story needs. So <clears throat> we ended up in Iceland because their genetic research was an important component to what we need to do with the story. Um, but we wanted to really draw upon uh, as wide a possible palette of, of different groups and in many ways make the, the, the countries that they were in as much a character as the characters themselves. Uh, I remember when we were in, uh, shooting up in San Francisco, we were meeting with the production coordinator from, from India, from Mumbai, who said, you know, unsolicited, we are all so excited and happy about this show because there are two kinds of movies we make in India. There are our own movies about us, small little films, and there are Western movies with an Indian backdrop. It doesn't really relate to us, we're just sort of the backdrop. This is the first TV show that's kind of about us, our religion and our beliefs and our cultures and our food. And so, you know, we are so proud of that. We, and we wanted to, to emphasize you know, the, the, the international scope of it as not just being a place, but as a character. To which point, 
when we shot the show, um, there's no stage work anywhere in there. We shot the entire show on location. So very often you'll, you'll, you'll cheat different places. No, we, we shot San Francisco, Chicago, Mexico City, London, Iceland, Berlin, Mumbai, Nairobi, and Seoul. And it was a, a tremendous road show. We wanted it to be authentic. Yeah, and the, the logistics, uh, just, just imagining a show taking place in so many places around the world and filming uh, in those places around the world uh, must be, you know, quite daunting. Uh, you know, is it, you know, how do you bounce all that from a, a writing process, a writing perspective, and then, you know, during production? Like, what, what's the timing like and, and the scheduling like? Well, interestingly enough, one of our biggest problems was the fact that because our, our characters are in each other's heads, we can have a character in uh, London or, or let's say San Francisco who's having a conversation in her head with someone in Berlin. So what you do, first you shoot that conversation in her apartment in San Francisco. You get both sides of the conversation. And six months later, you're shooting the exact same conversation in Berlin with the same blocking. And you can't change the dialogue because you've already locked it in. And you also have to be aware of the seasons. So that you know you have to be careful to time it so that if, if you're in springtime in San Francisco, you can't be looking out the window in Berlin while having a conversation and seeing fall leaves. So that was a problem. Plus, after we worked out the story and the details of where it was going to go, I was looking at this big board we put together of all the episodes. And I went, oh crap. And they said, What? The time zones. If Nomi is in a situation in San Francisco and needs help from Sun. But it's two in the morning and she's asleep, we're screwed. So we had to sit, we got all clocks, put them all over the room for every single time zone so we knew where everyone was at any particular time. It was logistically, it was a nightmare, but that made it feel more real. Uh, one of the things uh, that the show tackles so well is it, uh, I think it's very insightful about issues of, of gender and sexuality and, and the Wachowskis, of course, both, are both transgender women. Uh, do you think their unique perspectives bring something particularly special to, to the show that, that really no other creators could have? I, I do, actually. And the funny thing about it was that when we were creating the characters, we had everyone worked out and we were about to turn our attention to Nomi. And you know, I said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting, since she is sort of the, um, the, the, the transit point for information, she does both, both the internet world and the real world, she's a gateway character, why not make her transgendered? And Lana shot up out of her chair and danced around the room and pointed to, you know, to, to everyone else and said, it wasn't my idea this time, it was him, it was him, it was him, it was his idea this time, I didn't do it. Um, and, but what was cool about that was once we did that, it became, the character became kind of a, um, a, a true north for the storytelling. Uh, Lana's work has, you know, except for, for things like um, her, her first movie, it's like Bound, it would tend to be more about you know, guys and adventure stories and never, never had a chance to really deal with the gender issues. And having a chance now to address those things in the storytelling, I think lent an authenticity to the character and to the series and to Nomi's character that you know might not have been there otherwise. So uh, it was a great uh, marriage to have a transgender, you know, female character directing the movie and acting in the movie, and that really became kind of our, our lodestone, pointing true north at all times. Uh, that ensemble cast, uh, you know, of course, the main eight actors and and uh, all the characters who surround them uh, is a huge part of the show's uh, effect. Uh, and and you know, but most of the actors weren't especially well known, at least not in the United States. Uh, what was the casting process like? Yeah, you know, we didn't want to go for large names. I mean, the moment you put, you know, obviously you wouldn't get them, but you put Tom Cruise in a movie, it becomes about Tom Cruise playing this part. You wanted actors you could accept as being these characters. So we went for actors who were very skilled, on the, some of whom were on the cusp of breaking out, um, who really represented their country. And in a kind of a fun way, it became like this production or in the United Nations. And what would happen was that, you know, we would have, the way we shot it, um, when you're in San Francisco, for instance, Nomi, because it's all done from the character's point of view, Nomi is in every single scene, every single day, and has to carry the burden of that. Then she hands it off, you know, to, to Will, that character in, in Chicago, and now he's in every single scene, every single day, and he has to sort of carry the baton. Then it goes on to, to all the other characters, and each of them representing their country, 
now has to sort of carry the baton forward with the support of the rest. So that became kind of a lot, a lot of fun to, to mix up those cultures and those backgrounds and has each character represent their country. Uh, I have to ask about that uh, uh, unusual psychic sex scene from the first season, uh, uh, but yeah, which it's really provocative. But what's great about it is that I mean, you know, these characters are sharing intimate parts of their internal lives with each other. So of course, I mean, that would would include their sexuality. Uh, what was that like to to write and then film? Uh, it, it, that you know, that's happening in many locations as well as everything else in the show. Yeah, when when you know, a couple of characters are are being intimate with each other or sexual, everyone else feels that. And we wanted to sort of write a scene about that. And my problem is I am in myself, I am 14 years old. And so when we got to that part, I said, Lana, why, why don't you write that scene? Because I'll, I'll, I'll be shy and in the car hiding. Um, and some people said, well, why, why were some characters not in that scene? Why, why wasn't Sun in that scene? And, and why wasn't uh, Capus in that scene? Time zones, they were, <laughs> would have been asleep. Um, so yeah, it, like we wanted to- interesting dreams though. <laughs> yeah, very interesting dreams, uh, and we wanted we wanted to deal with issues of gender and sexuality and 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 identity. When we, we, we sold the show to Netflix, um, usually you go into pitch and talking about who's the bad guys, what's the conflict. We spent the entire time talking about identity and and who we are and privacy, and um, that became kind of the core of the show. We wanted to sort of stake out, particularly in a science fiction show, the areas of sexuality because science fiction shows not always, but for the most part, tend to be written for guys who are afraid of girls. And we wanted to have a sexual component in the beginning, so which is why we have that scene uh, with No Me in San Francisco in the first episode with the rainbow colored dildo. So let's, let's plant our flag literally and figuratively. Uh, the show is coming back for a second season uh, without giving too much away, of course. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about uh, what we can expect from season two? In the very broadest of sources, because I can't get into it too much, uh, in our first season, we had the first few episodes were designed to be confusing because we decided to film the show in a subjective perspective. What that means is in most TV shows, you see that your main character is talking about a situation, and you cut away to the bad guys or the cops who give you exposition and background of what this is all about, what's going on. We couldn't do that. The audience only knows what the eight characters know, and you, the audience, find out as they find it out. And so the mystery for a long time is what the hell is going on and why is this happening? You kind of get some intimations of that toward the end of the season, but once they, in the second season, broaden out to the rest of the world, they find other clusters and people who know what's going on. Now we begin to find out the mythology behind what it is to be a sensei are the brothers? Where do we come from? Why are they perceived to be a threat? So really, the second season is about providing a lot of answers to the questions that viewers had after seeing the first season. Uh, there, there have been a couple of uh, behind-the-scenes uh, shakeups, uh, you know, in, in season two. From from what I've read, you know, Lily Wachowski's taken a step back, and the role of uh, Capius was recast. Uh, have those changes had a, a significant effect on production? Well, first off, I want to dispel one of the rumors, Lily Wachowski did not walk off the show halfway through. It did not happen. What happened was before we even started the writing process, she was involved with the transition. She had a personal life to deal with. And we gave her the space to do that, said, don't worry about this season, you can come back for the third season. So you know, she really had that distance there from the beginning. She didn't like start in and just walk off with it. She doesn't do that. She's more responsible than that. Um, in terms of what happened with Amal, I was not there on the scene. Uh, that was something that happened between the two of them, and I respect both their choices to say this may not be the, the best fit. Now, uh, a lot of the work you've done, uh, you know, even before uh, Sensei, uh, throughout your career, uh, has been in science fiction. Uh, what, what appeals to you about this genre in particular? What science fiction does is it allows you to ask the big questions. Um, in the average TV show, it's, are they going to save the busload of kids? Of course they are. Are they going to stop the bomb from blowing up Manhattan? Of of course they are. Those are questions with relatively easy answers. Science fiction allows you to ask questions that don't have easy answers. They're designed to start bar fights. Who are we as a people? Where did we come from? Why, why are we here? Where are we going? Who do we trust? What is the, the you know, life for? And those have always appealed to me. I think I'm a Russian background. I'm incapable of telling 
small, short, simple stories. And the opportunity to ask of us, you know, who are we and what do we care about? What does it, what does it all mean? Uh, it's very appealing. So to me, science fiction has always allowed me to ask those questions. I've done mainstream stuff as well, the changeling and other things, but science fiction, because it allows you to examine larger questions, always thought, has always had my heart. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, th this you know, unique concept is that you know, watching this show, I couldn't help but imagine who would be, like if I could choose my own Sense8 cluster, who would be in, who, whose consciousness would I like to share? And I was just wondering, have you ever had those thoughts or is there anyone from around the world who you, you'd have in your ideal Sense8 cluster? I know I, I don't like people. <laughs> I just rather keep them out of my cluster. I have a cluster of one and a half. It's me and my cat. I'm happy with that. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for uh, talking to me today, and congratulations on on the first season of the show, and and best of luck on season two. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you. I appreciate it.